Okay, so hello, my name is Neve. I am a front end web developer. And today I want to talk about Storybook and Chromatic and why I think it's worth learning both of these tools. Now, if you are a front end dev, you might be thinking, oh my God, more front end libraries that I have to go and learn. And sure, I get that. I mean, there are loads of libraries out there and it's not always easy keeping up with all of them, but I promise you these ones are really, really useful. So I'm going to focus on Storybook for most of this talk, and I'll dive into Chromatic a little bit at the end. But first, I want to let you know why I think Storybook is worth learning. And it's for two key reasons. One, it streamlines UI testing and documentation, and it drives clean, sustainable component libraries. And my goal for this talk is to unpack each of these points. So we'll be talking about the need for Storybook in the first place, looking at the production process problems it solves, and what impact Storybook has not just on the whole team, but especially on developers. Then we'll get stuck into some code where I'll show you how to get it up and running. And we'll finish with the really fun stuff where we'll dive into Storybook ecosystem a bit more, building our own tooling in the Storybook UI, and we'll even automate our own testing with Chromatic. Now, I will caveat, I will be using React in this talk. Um, I imagine there are a lot of React users watching this, but if you use a different framework, you should still be able to apply the concepts pretty easily. So I don't think it's a big deal. But before we dive into it, a little about me. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Neve, and I am a front-end web developer. I am from Dublin in Ireland, where I now live and work for a digital consultancy called Elswen, who are based in London. And mostly, I'm just really delighted to be giving this talk and sharing these skills today. So let's just get started. Um, and we'll start with the need for Storybook. And to unpack this, I want to think about what a typical production process might look like for some teams. So say you're working on a project where you are the main developer maintaining the front end of a website. Say the site's already built using React, so you have some existing components, it's already live, it's looking great, and everything is working as normal. Your job is to update the site with a new page. Well, this is what that production process might look like. So first, the marketing team has to go and create some content. Then the designer has to design it. Then the designs will be handed over to the developer. Then the developer builds the page. Once the page is built, the dev will hand it over to the testing environment, to the QA team. And the QA tester will then test this new page. And if everything looks good, the page will then get deployed. Fantastic. Seems easy enough, right? Well, not necessarily all the time. Um, and that's because oftentimes, as if out of nowhere, when the build finally reaches that testing stage, content often just doesn't quite fit. Say you might start to spot lots of niggly differences between the design and the build, where it might not look completely broken, but it also doesn't totally match the design either, which can be really annoying. And this happens because even though we're using the same components all the time, we're adding slightly different uh, content each time. So chances are it's going to look slightly different. So let's talk about how this impacts your entire team. Say this snag happens with your new page. You might think, OK, well, why don't we just change the content to make it look right? You absolutely could do that. And here's what that process might look like. First, the QA has to spot the snag. Then if it's to do with content, they'll discuss it with the marketing team. The marketing team has to update that content. Once that's done, they will hand over to the developer. Then the dev will update the code. Then the developer merges it into the test environment and hands back to the QA. The QA then assesses the amends. And if the content fits, great, it's done. If not, you have to repeat this entire process all over again. So you can see the issue here, right? What seems like a small and straightforward change actually takes up a lot of resources and affects so many people on the team, but especially developers. Because say, you know, there are multiple devs on a team or people are hopping in and out of a project, you can easily end up in a situation where different devs are building multiple instances of the same components and you just end up with duplicates all over the place. Thankfully, this is where a storybook helps us out. So firstly, what is storybook? Um, storybook is a front end tool that's used by a lot of different companies like Elswen, GitHub, Airbnb and Stripe, for example. 
and it lets you build and maintain components in total isolation. And what do I mean by isolation? Well, even though in your code base, your component has its own file, usually by the time it gets to the browser, it's already incorporated into a larger design, working with lots of different types of content and elements on the page. Storybook lets you see every component on its own in the browser before you start incorporating anything else. So let's dig into it. I am going to take you through how to install Storybook, what it looks like both in the code and in your browser, how to configure your setup, and lastly, how to create some stories and add some fun tools to the UI. So for the install, I have used NPM and Create React App purely because it's nice and quick. So for the installation, it's important to note you cannot install Storybook on an empty project. You already need to have one set up. Um, Storybook supports most of popular fr front-end frameworks, so you can choose whatever you're most comfortable with. In this example, using Create React App, all you need are these three commands. So you download and execute Create React App, you navigate into it, and you start it up. Once that's up and running, you can then install Storybook. And you do this by navigating into your app, running npx sb init, and then run npm run Storybook to launch it. OK, so let's say you have the installation done. Now let's find your way around. And we'll start off by having a look at Storybook in the browser. So after running that last Storybook command, Storybook is going to automatically open up in the browser for you. And this is what it's going to look like. As you can see, it's got a nice beginner-friendly landing page to help you get started with docs and guides and examples. And in the main window here, you have what's called the canvas, which is where your components are going to appear. And on the left-hand side is a sidebar where your components are listed. And you can click into any of them to view them in this canvas. So let's take a look. So you'll notice here that under each component, you have these various versions listed. These are called stories, and they describe particular states of a component. For example, logged in or logged out, or primary, secondary, et cetera. All we need to know is that these are called stories. So as well as stories to display different states, you also have what are called controls, which can appear underneath the canvas here. Controls are how you play around with the component. So for example, with the button component, you can control its size, its label, and play around with different styles as well. As a developer, it'll be up to you completely which controls are added here. So you can add as many or as few as you like. OK, so that's the browser. Now let's see what this looks like in our code environment. So in your file directory, you will see that Storybook has created a Storybook folder containing a main and a preview file. And these two files are where your Storybook environment is configured. So let's take a look at main first. Unsurprisingly, this is your main config file, and it's where Storybook's server behavior is controlled. For now, all we want to know are these key fields that were generated for us. Stories is an array of globs indicating the location of your story files. Add-ons is a list of add-ons you're using. Framework is your framework-specific config to help loading a building. And Core configures Storybook's internal features, for example, builders like Webpack. So that's all we really need to know about the main file. Let's have a look at the preview file. Now, this file controls the way stories are rendered. So for now, the only export is in here is the parameters object. And all we need to know right now is that this is where we're setting parameters for all of our stories at once. We will come back to this file later on to add some fun decorators to our components. But for now, we'll leave it and we'll go and look at our story files. So. To create a component story, we first have to create a story file for Storybook to read. And the file name should be structured with the component name followed by .stories.js or JSX or whatever you like. And once you do this, Storybook is going to put them into the browser for you. And this is essentially all you need to find your way around Storybook in a code environment. So you've got your two config files and your story components, and that's it. So next, let's tailor it to our own preferences. We'll start by adding our own dependencies. So I've downloaded style components to do some basic styling and build some design themes that we're going to use. I have also downloaded TypeScript and its relative type definitions for style components because I like having everything strongly typed, and I highly recommend that you do as well. 
Now, you will obviously add whatever dependencies you like, but for now, I'm just going to stick with these ones to keep things simple. Okay, so let's say you've downloaded all your dependencies. Next, let's update our file structure a little bit. So on the left here is the file structure that's automatically generated by Create React App on Storybook, which is perfectly functional, but I prefer to have all of my components in their own folders with their relative styles and stories. So I've created a components folder in which each component contains its own index, style, and story file. And this is just my preference because I think it makes things a little easier to navigate, and I highly recommend it if you're just starting out yourself. And as you can see as well, I've downloaded TypeScript now, so I've also updated my file, na file names from JSX to TSX. OK, so you might remember our main JS file is where we're telling Storybook to go and find our stories. So after changing the file structure, I want to update this main file to make sure that everything is still working. So on top here is what our main file looks like by default, listing all the directories in which to find your stories. And as you can see at the bottom, I've updated this glob to look in the components folder only, which is where I've moved all of my stories to. So now we have everything installed. We know our way around the browser and our environment, and we have configured our own settings. So now the fun part. The first thing we're going to do is export some stories. And we'll do this with a default export object describing what goes in the sidebar in the browser and a named story export, which describes the story itself. So let's give it a go in our button stories file. So in our button story file, we will export a default object, pass it a title, which is what's going to appear in the sidebar. So for example, we'll put it under components and we'll label it button. And we're also going to pass it the component itself, which we've imported above. So. Now let's make our named export, which defines the component story. And you write this like any other component function, only here we're going to use what Storybook calls args. And args work the same way you'd normally pass arguments to any function, but in Storybook, they are described in one JavaScript object. So when we go to pass values to all of our component props, we're not just going to inherit them from the parent component. Instead, we're going to be passing them from the story's args object, which we're going to create after this. So you can see we're going to be passing props like label, disabled, states, size, and button kind as well. Lovely. So now we have our default export telling the browser what title and component to render the sidebar, and our first named export called primary. And we're calling it this because we're setting the button kind to primary so that it only inherits the primary button styles. OK. So let's create our args object to pass some values to the rest of our props. So we will create primary.args. And from here, we can pass whatever values we want, so long as they are the right types. right? So for example, the label prop is expecting a string type, so we'll set that to subscribe. Disabled's boolean, we'll set that to false by default. And size is also a string, so we're going to set that to small. So now we have our beautiful args object. And from here, we're passing some default values to our component story. Now, I've already set these props up to work with style components. So depending on what values we pass, we should see some style changes to our primary story. So let's take a look at the button in the browser. Stunning. As you can see, we now have our primary button story. But what if we want to make a secondary story? Well, to do this, we just create another named function that uses the button, but this time with the secondary string passed to the kind prop and some default secondary values in the secondary args. And we can do this as many times as we want for each story. So here we've also added a danger story in the exact same way using the button component, but setting the button's kind prop to danger and adding some different values to the danger args object to see what this button looks like with the warning label and as a size large. So now, when we go back to the browser, we'll be able to see all of our stories and all of the different states and props, which is pretty cool. The next thing we want to be able to do is play around with them using the controls panel we looked at earlier. And we do this with something called arg types. 
So the same way we created an arg object, we're going to create an arg types object as well. Each key is going to reference an already existing arg, and each value will be a control object. And all the control object does is it just tells the browser what type of editing control to give to this particular arg. So for example, label we know is a string, we want to give that a control type of text. Disabled, we know is a Boolean, so we'll set that. And size, we're going to give it a control type of select, which is a drop down. So we'll also be able to pass it an options array. And each item in this array is going to be one of the items in the drop down menu that the user can select from. So we'll give it small, medium, and large. So now, if we click the controls icon in our UI, it'll bring up the controls panel where we'll see everything we have just added. So for instance, you can see what your button looks like in a disabled state or an enabled state. You can use the drop down menu in the size prop to see how it looks in different sizes. And you can do this for every different story. So you can see what the label looks like with different call to action in a secondary state. Or you can see what it looks like in a danger state when it's disabled or enabled. So for example, here you can see what this looks like with a bunch of different components that I made earlier, like nav, headers, footers, etc. And we can use the controls to play around with the layout of this component, for example. Or we could even play around with the background colors of our title component using the color picker control, which is a nice bit of UI as well that comes out of the box with Storybook. So it's pretty nice. And you can reset them using that reset button on the right there. So fantastic. So far, we have installed Storybook. We got to know the UI and the dev environment. We have configured our setup the way we like it. We created some stories, and we've even added some controls. So it's great. Now for the really fun stuff. So we're going to finish off by demoing a couple of cool features. First, we will build our own theme switcher tool in the Storybook UI. And we'll do this by creating one of those Storybook decorators I mentioned earlier. And we're going to start with where we want our theme switcher to um, be in the UI. So you might have noticed already, above every component story in the UI is a toolbar that comes equipped with a bunch of different tools by default. So if we take a look, you'll be able to see you can have a look at the component's borders. You can even inspect its padding. You can see what it looks like on different devices, which is very handy. If you work with a designer in a grid system, you can look at your component against that. And you can see what it looks like with a light and dark background. And this dark background is actually going to break our component now. So as you can see, it only sets the background. It has no influence over the rest of the component styles. And this is something that our decorator is going to fix. So let's start with a quick example of adding a padding decorator. And we'll do that here in our default export by adding a decorators array. And I'll add this while we keep the UI in view so we can see the updates as we code. So we'll pass our default export a decorators array. And each item in that array is a function, a function that will accept the story as an argument, wrap it in whatever styling you want. And in this case, we're going to give it just some extra padding. So we'll give it a padding of like three RAM. And if you keep your eye on the story on the right hand side, you'll notice the component automatically takes on this decorator styling. So it's just jumped there. And if you inspect the components, you'll see the components padding and also the decorators padding that it's just inherited. So just to recap, you can see we're adding a decorators array to our story's default export. We're passing it one decorator function to the decorators array. This takes the story as an argument and wraps it in some style. But what if we want to pass the same styles to each component? You don't want to have to do this every single time, right? Well, the good news is that you do not have to. Um, let's head over to our preview file from earlier and add a global decorator there, which will apply to all of our stories by default. OK, so we're creating a theme switcher, right? Let's write a with theme function that will apply our theme and global styling to all of our stories. So just like before, we'll pass the story argument and we'll also pass the context. So every decorator function can take this second optional argument called context. And this contains metadata about the story, like parameters and globals, which is what we're going to use it for here. And since we're using style components, we'll wrap our story in a theme provider element and pass our theme prop to that, which we have yet to define. And we'll get our theme 
from the context object that we have passed in there and then the globals. So we'll say theme equals context dot parameters dot theme. And if not that, we'll get it from context dot globals dot theme. And we want to render the logic. So we'll say the story theme, if it's dark, we'll render our dark theme that we have set up earlier in style components. And if not, we will render our light theme. And just like how we export our parameters from this file, we will need to export our decorators array as well. So we will export const decorators equals an array with one single function, which is with theme. Fabulous. So we have created a with theme function that takes two arguments. First, the story itself. Second, the story's context, where we're getting our metadata from. And we're applying our global styles by including that in our return with the story and telling our decorator to get the theme from the story parameters and to use it in with style components theme provider. So now we have this amazing decorator. We want to use it, right? And we want to use it in the UI's toolbar. So let's set that bit up. So I'm going to keep the nav component in view for this so we can see when the toolbar updates. And to add a control to the toolbar, we just have to add a global types object to our preview file. So we'll export const global types. And as I say, this is an object. We're going to give it a theme object. And that will take a name, which I think we'll just call theme. It'll also take a description, which we will set to global theme for components. We're going to give it a default value. So we want it to just be light by default. And we're going to pass it a toolbar object. So this is where we're setting the toolbar itself. In that object, we're going to give it an icon. We'll say a hollow circle to indicate the light theme. And we're going to pass it an items array as well. So every item, every object in this item array is going to be an item in the drop down menu. And each item is an object. It takes a value, which in this case will be light. It takes an icon, which is a hollow circle to indicate the light theme. And we'll give it a title, which will be light as well. And you guessed it, we'll do another one for the dark theme, which takes the uh, same object, same values, but we'll just set it to dark instead with a filled in circle instead of a hollow one. So now you can see automatically we've got this lovely little drop down menu in our toolbar. And when you're on dark theme, it's a filled in circle. When you're on light theme, it's a hollow circle. And this applies to every single one of your components in your library, no matter what. So if you flick through, you'll be able to look at the different components with the different themes. Fantastic. So all you have to do to add a control to your toolbar is export this global types object. Now in the UI, when you toggle between light and dark, your toolbar item values are passed as your story parameters, which then get passed to your decorator function and used to decide which theme to render. Fabulous. Now, one last cool thing to show you before I finish up, we are going to automate some UI testing with Chromatic. So in case you haven't heard of it, Chromatic is a tool chain that helps ship your components faster. So it lets you publish your storybook library to their CDN. It provides visual regression testing on all of your components, and it enables UI reviews for your components as well. So I'm going to walk through what this looks like now. So I don't think I have time to go through the whole setup with you. You could do a whole other talk on Chromatic. But for now, I'll quickly mention how this process goes. So first, when you go to the Chromatic website, it'll prompt you to create an account with your GitHub. Then it's going to give you an app ID and a project token, and then give you a command you can use to publish your storybook to their CDN. So once you've done these three things, you will have an account, and I'll show you what that looks like. So when you're set up and you log in, this is what you're going to see, your dashboard. Click into one of your projects, you'll see all the different builds from that project. And you've got a menu on the left here. You can click pull requests and you can see which ones are open and which ones are closed. And you also have a library tab, which shows you the complete component library that's associated with your storybook. And what's really handy is that you can click on view storybook up here 
and we'll open up your storybook library in its own link. And you can share this link with whoever you want, no matter what permissions they have or what kind of access they have. It's open to everyone, which is really handy uh, when you want to share your storybook with anyone on your team. Okay, so what's next? We are going to automate our UI testing. And to do this, you will need to add your chromatic project token to your GitHub secrets, create a chromatic workflow with GitHub actions that looks a bit like this. So here I've made a chromatic YML file in my GitHub directory, and I've added in the steps I want chromatic to run through every time I push some code to our repo. So I'm going to demo this by making a change to one of my components. So let's say I'm going to change some styling in my footer component. I'll go into my style file. I'll change the padding from 2rem to 4rem. And I'll save it. And I'm already on my footer styles branch here. So I'm just going to add those changes. And I will commit them with a message saying feet increase footer padding. And once that's committed, I'm going to push it up to GitHub. So now if I go over to GitHub, I will see my new branch, footer styles, there it is, and I'll make a pull request. And now what's going to happen is once I make my pull request, we're going to see all of the different tests that Chromatic is automatically running. So you can see that the Chromatic deployment is already in progress here. And now you can see we also have some more tests that are pending. So we have our UI review, which is going to prompt you to have a look at the components and accept the changes yourself and some UI tests that it's also running on any components that have changes to them. As well, it's publishing to the storybook as well. So if we click onto details, say in the UI test first, it's going to take us into Chromatic, into the specific build. And you'll see here that it's got tests running for the footer component and the nav component as well. So if we want to review these changes, we just click on review changes. And it's going to take us through the components one by one. And you can have a look at the previous version on the left, and the updated version on the right. And you can kind of toggle between the visual differences here using this button as well. So you can accept this by clicking Accept, and then it brings you to the next component. Looks good to me, so I think we'll just accept this one as well. OK, great. So now all of our UI tests are passing because they've been accepted. Fabulous. If we go back to our PRs, we'll see we have our footer padding PR still to review. So increase footer padding here, one visual change found. If we can view change set here, you'll notice it's a similar thing here. You can flick between the differences and you can ping one of your colleagues to review if you want by assigning a reviewer, or you can just approve it yourself. So now you can see that all of the tests and all of the re reviews have passed. So I can go back to my GitHub PR you can see now that all the checks have passed and I am able to merge. Fabulous. So that is it. So you can see here, when we made our PR, we have deployed to Chromatic, we published our storybook, we triggered some UI reviews, and we triggered some UI tests as well. And this is really great because it treats UI reviews almost like code reviews, which makes it much harder for your components to visually regress over time. And other teammates get to review UI changes before they even reach a testing environment, which makes things so much more efficient. And that's it. So we've now made a fully working storybook component library, complete with a custom made theme switching tool and automated visual regression testing on all of our components. Fantastic. So if you just take it back for a second and remember this long, very convoluted production process from earlier. Well, this is what it looks like now with Storybook and Chromatic. The whole team can do some visual QA as the dev builds. The QA then does final testing, and then you deploy. Way fewer steps, way less back and forth between departments. Can you believe? So now your teams are much more independent across the board. Your dev team doesn't become a bottleneck every time you need to make any visual updates. Your component libraries are much cleaner and easier to navigate. Your docs are always up to date and your libraries are always being maintained. So if anyone's tempted to give it a go, I highly recommend it. Storybook has really great documentation and lots of tutorials and resources online. 
And there are lots of really cool add-ons and plugins out there that you can use with other parts of your workflow. If you wanna run accessibility tests or plug your storybook into Figma, for example, it's all out there. So hopefully after this talk, you're starting to feel a little less, oh my God, not another front end library and a little more like Nicolas Cage in The Breeze, stunning. So that is it from me. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. You can find me on Twitter here where I talk about things other than Storybook. I should also caveat, I don't actually work for Storybook. I work for Elswin, totally separate thing. Um, I'm just a big fan. So for now, I think, you know, there's nothing left to say, but thank you so much for listening.